Great. Welcome to the College of Complexes, everybody. My name's Don, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be... Uh, we have a, a great program this evening. We have a very special speaker. Uh, uh, the speaker is uh, Rosalie Regal, uh, and she's going to be talking about Dorothy Day, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. She also is the um, author of this book, uh, Dorothy Day, Portraits by Those Who Knew Her. Uh, now, uh, and I think I think the author also has books available for those who uh, I don't know if these are available for, for purchase or not, but you can talk to me about. So let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker, Rosalie Regal. history project on the Five. crossing lines and doing time for peace. Do you need a minute? What did you get? And all four of my books are for sale after the um, uh, presentation if you'd like to buy them. Thank you. Before I start, I just have to say a word about Michael Moore. I was born in Flint. I used to write with Michael Moore. Um, back when he had something called the Flint Voice, and then it became the Michigan Voice. It was a whole underground newspaper. Um, one day, uh, Michael's partner and <clears throat> some other women and I took over the paper and had an all-women's issue. Um, didn't let any men write for us, and we had an article about abortion, I remember, and I used a picture of my daughter with a balloon burst all over her face. It was actually a marvelous photo. And my husband's job had a bit. But anyway, um, good times with Michael Moore. Do see the movie. It was his first movie. It changed his life dramatically. Today I'm going to talk about Dorothy Day, co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. So of course I'll also be talking about the Catholic Worker Movement. And I want to say that we have several people here today who are um, Catholic workers, and one of them who has um, lived with Dorothy Day, been jailed with Dorothy Day, um, knows probably much more about Dorothy Day than I do. So. I'm very glad to welcome my Catholic worker friends, young and older, not old. So I'm hoping very much that they will participate in the um, rebuttal period. How did I become interested in Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker? I came to the worker through the anti-war movement. I just started teaching at Saginaw Valley, what's now Saginaw Valley State University. My students introduced me to the anti-war movement, my friends to the Catholic worker, and um, <coughs> Dorothy Day. She came to our town of Saginaw on her last visit to the Midwest, or one of her last visits to the Midwest, in 1969. And I went to see her. Um, she didn't pay much attention to us. We were just young peace people. She gave a short presentation. She was older. She was um, so tall and quite commanding. Um, I thought she was really old. Not about as old as I am now, but I mean, I thought she was really old um, back in my young days. And um, she seemed concentrated to me. She didn't seem diminished with age at all. Well, what I remember most about Dorothy, and I think it, it illustrates something that, that, that I voice when I learn more about her, I realized, is that she was still learning. Oh, sweetheart. She spent most of the evening sitting, we, you know, we had a, a, group, a room about this big above a storefront, and um, a Catholic worker house called the Thomas Merton House had brought her there. And she um, spent most of the evening sitting and listening to a young woman talk about the Welfare Rights League. The Welfare Rights League, I think our group, it was a local group, a Saginaw group of mothers 
working to get their rights. And she was just fascinated by that. And Dorothy was always looking for these little personalist movements. Um, she understood the, the principle of subsidiarity, which I think some of you probably who know economics more can talk more about that than I can. But subsidiarity is small and local. It's doing things on a local way. So she was really kind of fascinated by what this young African-American woman was doing to make her own life and the life of her sisters better. So that's when I met her today. I never lived with her. I didn't have a Catholic worker then. I just met her that one time. But she influenced me tremendously and eventually ended up changing my life in many ways. When I hear the word influence, I think of these, you know, politicians cozying up, to, or lobbyists cozying up to politicians. But who influenced me was this enigmatic, endlessly fascinating co-founder of the Catholic Worker named Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day was built, born November 1st, 1897 in Brooklyn. She lived a peripatetic childhood. She moved from um, Brooklyn to San Francisco, actually lived in Berkeley and Oakland, where she was um, in the San Francisco earthquake from 1906. Um, some people who work on her think that that really affected her. Um, I'm certainly not a psychological a psycho historian, so I won't go into that. Then um, they moved to Chicago in, I believe, 1909. And she, her father was a newspaper man, so he was in and out of a job. And um, for a while, he was very much out of a job, at home, looking for a job. Things were not good. She had a, a, a period of real, real poverty for a time in her childhood. And um, then he got a job again on the Star, I think. And they moved to Webster Avenue. So she graduated from high school here. Um, went to Waller, which became um, Lincoln Park High, was able to study Greek and Latin in high school. And I was able to get two years of Latin in high school, but there was nobody in Flint, Michigan that studied Greek when I was in high school. Um, she went to the University of Illinois for two years and met some interesting, interesting leftists and became, she always wanted to be a writer. She loved words from the get-go. But she decided to go where the writers were, and that's Greenwich Village, New York City. So she hightailed it to Manhattan. Her dad, particularly her dad, was very upset about this. He did not think that newspaper work was suitable for a young woman. And when you look at some of the the escapades that he did with the Hialeah racetrack and going to Cuba in the uh, wild days, um, you can see what he was thinking about. But Dorothy was determined, so she defied her parents and um, lived um, in Greenwich Village, partied with the likes of Eugene O'Neill, wrote for the socialist call and for the masses, um, did some really interesting articles, um, many times a woman's view, and one could see, even in those early articles, I think, some um, incidences that she would later be known for a personalist anarchism. She was arrested for the first time as a suffragist and spent a miserable time in jail um, um, outside of D.C. Um, all of this early work is um, told in two books. The first is her absolutely lovely, lovely autobiography, very finely crafted, and as an English teacher, I would teach it in a memoir class called The Long Loneliness. But it's not a tell-all autobiography by any means. It's crafted to show her search for God. And when one reads along loneliness, one sees that even as a child, she was a little fascinated with the Bible. 
she was fascinated by a neighbor whom she saw kneeling and saying her prayers after her children had gone to school. Um, Dorothy grew up in a um, nominally Episcopalian household, but really it was a household with no religion. And she was fascinated with um, the rituals of religion, but didn't know anything about it. She lived uncautiously, I guess would be a nice way to say it, um, during her Greenwich Village days. Um, followed a man named Lionel Moisey to um, Chicago, had an abortion, just had a really pretty wild time with him, um, had a marriage that we don't know really much about to a man much his, much her senior. Um, very short-lived marriage. There's a record of the divorce, but not a record of the marriage. And then she met the man that really settled her down, Foster Baderham. Dorothy had written a novel called The Love and Fortune. She used to run around trying to get all the copies back. It wasn't a very good novel, but it was, a, it was pretty autobiographical, and it's in that novel that she confessed to an abortion. And based on that novel, they, she sold the seat. They, Hollywood brought the screen rights to it, never produced it, um, but she got enough money, and she bought a little cabin on Staten Island. Hmm. Moved there with the love of her life, the human love of her life, Foster Batterham. Um, she didn't think she could have a baby after this abortion, but she was pregnant soon. And it was when she was pregnant that she um, <coughs> discovered God. She was so overjoyed to be pregnant. And I can't find my copy of the long roll in this, so I would have brought it with me to read. Um, how she felt about that. When Tamara was born, um, she named she baptized her child Tamara Therese and had her baptized. She did not want Tamara to go through the traumas of growing up that she did. And then, rather mysteriously, even to herself, she became a Roman Catholic herself. Yes, sir. She had always sort of looked at the Catholic Church um, when she was living in Manhattan, because it was the immigrant church. She saw it as a church for the poor, but she knew very, she knew very little about Catholicism and um, was schooled for her before her baptism and receiving the sacraments by a very simple nun who just made her memorize the catechism, you know, who made you, God made you, just very simple things. So, um, she was Catholic, but she didn't really know why, and she didn't know much about it, actually. So she, Foster would not marry her. Um, he just would, he wouldn't marry her civilly or religiously, and she was going to be a Catholic and obey all the rules. So she left him. It was a traumatic thing. One of the wonderful things that's happened in the last 10 years is that we now have Dorothy Day's diaries and her letters, and they have been published. Um, they were um, sequestered for 25 years after her death in 1980 because she didn't want to hurt anybody that might have been living that she talked about in her diaries. So she closed them for 25 years. Now they're out. And one of the most wonderful things um, is that we have the letters that she, many of the letters, not all of them actually, but many of the letters that she and Foster exchanged after she had left him. So what we thought was just kind of closing the door, um, no more, was in fact an ongoing thing. She tried to get him to come back and, and marry her. And she said, I won't be Catholic and have all those saints statues around and everything. You know, I won't interfere with your life. Anyway, he wouldn't. When I wrote my book years and years later, I was pleased to discover that in the later years of their life, when she was in her 70s and confined to Berry House, the Catholic Worker House, she and Foster were again close. And he would come over in the evening, and they'd sit around just like regular old married folks 
um, have a glass of wine. Tamara, their daughter, would be there. She was now on the ground, a mother, grandmother herself. Um, so they would sit and watch television together and just kind of have a normal life. So that was kind of nice to know. It was something I discovered um, when I interviewed people who had known her, because of course almost everybody that knew her in her early life was dead by the time I started the book. Dorothy battered around for about five years after she became a Catholic. She wanted to be a Catholic and she wanted to be a writer and she wanted to live a real Christianity, a, I guess what we would almost call a muscular Christianity, a, a, a true authentic Christianity and she couldn't figure out how to do it. So she was covering um, a workers' march in New York in 1930, or excuse me, in D.C. in 1932, and um, Tamara had been born in 1927, and um, she prayed. She went to the shrine of the Immaculate Conception in D.C., and she prayed to God that he would send her away to unite her writing life, which she dearly loved. She always put a um, writer on her passport. She very much um, identified as a, herself as a writer. And her Catholicism. She came home, and here, literally on her doorstep, was this French man named Peter Morin. Peter Morin was as different from Dorothy as you could imagine. He was um, French, had a very heavy accent, um, had been a Christian brother, very deeply schooled in the European intellect Catholic intellectual tradition of the early 20th century. She was an American pacifist with sort of Native American roots and very little um, Europe, very little depth to her education. Together, they made a team. Now, I won't say that they were really close friends, so once in a while you hear some Stuff that they were really close. I don't think they were. I think their personalities were way too different. But intellectually, they made a team. Together, they decided to start a newspaper. That was the Catholic Worker. It started first as a newspaper. And, you know, we're talking 1932 here. 33, May 1st, the first newspaper came out. It's still big depression times. I did a um, PowerPoint presentation on the Gothic Worker last week, and I used that soup line picture. Soup lines all over the place. You could see the poverty. And um, that's what they wrote about. They wrote about the economics of poverty. They wrote about why. Um, and um, they wrote about what we should do, which is basically feed people and shelter people. And people started coming. They did not intend, I don't think, to start a movement, but a movement started because of what they wrote, which is kind of exciting if you're a writer and like words, that the words were able to make some changes. So they were living on the Lower East Side, um, renting rooms, and um, people started coming. So we had a movement the Catholic Worker Movement. The paper started out with an initial run, run, uh, run of only 2,500 and um, in 1933 and by 1940 they were printing 120,000. Now some of these were distributed to parishes in bulk, so I'm not sure 120,000 people were actually subscribing. But it sold for a penny a copy and Peter Moore and Dorothy Day and anybody who lived with her would go out to the street corners and sell the, the newspaper. Um, and there would be people, read the worker, you know, because the communists Hector. Um, were all around, and then read, read the worker daily, and he'd say, read the word the daily, and then read the Catholic worker daily. So, you know, the name Catholic worker was very definitely chosen this, by Dorothy, by the way, not by Peter to, um, to uh, be an answer to communism. She was a socialist. She was 
she would call herself an anarchist. Most people think her anarchism wasn't of the political variety, but of a personalist variety. And Carl Meyer can probably speak to that a lot. I think some of you will be able to speak to that in the um, Q&A. But um, Peter wanted to call the newspaper the Catholic Radical. But Dorothy won that little contest. And she ended up winning many um, disagreements with Peter over the years. One of the quips of the Catholic worker is that uh, Dorothy was all for anarchy as long as she could be the chief anarchist. Ah. <laughs> uh, she was the leader of the movement. Peter was the brains. Now, I think Dorothy had a fantastic intelligence, but her intelligence was, as she says, more of the practical variety. It was also awfully, tremendously eclectic. Um, she loved everything from um, the novels of Dostoevsky to detective stories. She loved art. She loved opera. Every Saturday afternoon that she possibly could was devoted to opera. And there's one story of um, she's trying to listen to the opera and Peter, so she sort of told Peter not to talk, and he's whispering to her while she's listening to the opera. <laughs> you know, he just wouldn't give up. Peter was a talker. Peter also provided the intellectual roots that Dorothy needed. These 19th century, early 20th century, European intellectuals and Russian intellectuals like Borja and Emmanuel Monsonier. He introduced her to the social encyclicals of the Catholic Church. This poor little nun didn't know anything about them. But Rerum Navarum and Quadragesimo Anno, um, I haven't studied them since college, but they were the social encyclicals that gave the Catholic Church what we now call a preferential option for the poor. The encyclicals that critiqued capitalism and foresaw what capitalism was going to do to the economy of the world. So Peter gave Dorothy all of those things. He also proposed three things that would help to change society. He borrowed that IWW slogan to build a new world in the shell of a new life in the shell of the new world in the shell of the old. And they were clarification of thought, in other words, intense intellectual discussion, like the kind the college does when you're being good and that's really wrong. <laughs> you know, clarifying thought by talking about it and reading. Um, houses of hospitality to feed and shelter the poor, and farming communes where people could learn to live a living, to make to make a living, and learn to support themselves. And the the idea of subsidiarity and distributivism, where people worked for themselves and did for themselves and had their own um, every every. All, everybody sipping in their own olive tree and a plant to sit under it. Everybody owning pro property um, was very important to Peter and Dorothy learned from him. But she was the leader. And and maybe Carl can help me on this a bit when, because Carol Meyer lived with her um, and was very close to her when he had Catholic worker houses here. Dorothy's personality was compelling. She was um, a complex woman, a commanding woman, not in the kind of rah-rah way, but people say that when she walked into a room, you knew it. You know, heads would turn. She was beautiful when she was young. She was um, statuesque in a way when she got older. And, um, she spoke softly, often diffidently, but what she said was, was people listened to her, people saw her, and people were converted. People changed because of Dorothy Day. She had just a tremendous influence. 
on, um, on everybody. Um, you know, it's really easy to um, create a Dorothy Day that's in your own image or the Dorothy Day that you want her to be. And um, I know I f felt fall guilty of that because I met Dorothy Day through the anti war movement, so that's how I came to the worker. I tend to see her as this big critique of. Um, of uh, government, and particularly in its war-making capacities, but in basically she <laughs> critiqued government in many ways. Um, I think people who have um, big bones to pick with the Catholic Church will remember, and I tend to quote this a lot myself, she would often say, to quote Romano Bardini, the Church is the cross upon which Christ is crucified. She saw the Roman Catholic Church in its pomp and circumstances, I think, for what, for what it is. Um, conservative Catholics don't talk about that. They talk about the fact that she was, quote, a loyal doctor, of the, loyal daughter of the church. And she was. She absolutely obeyed all the commandments or tried to. She didn't marry Foster because she wouldn't marry Foster without being married by a priest, and he wouldn't go for it. Um, she. Uh, quit smoking, although that's not exactly not Catholic, but she, uh, um, she used to drink a lot and she didn't drink very much when she became, you know, when they started the Catholic worker. She eventually quit smoking, she cleaned up her salty language. She really tried to be good. She tried to be good. She tried to curb her temper. She spent her whole life trying to curb her temper. Mm -hmm. And in the last time, she was interviewed a lot by Robert Coles, the Harvard psychiatrist. And the last time she saw him, and he told me this, she said, I've even learned to be less impatient. So she had her flaws, as one of the fellows from my interview told me. Thank God she was human. You know, she was not a plaster sick. And we are now working pretty hard to make sure that if she is canonized as an official saint, that they don't um, sanitize her out of existence. Mm -hmm. There is some um, evidence that that's what they're going to do. I read the most amazing things now. Um, <laughs> for instance, I read just this week, apropos of her being a royal daughter of the church, that she would never let um, priests say mass at a Catholic, at her Catholic worker house, Catholic worker house where she lived, unless he was in vestments. And then one of the very few, few first pictures I saw was a picture by, in a book by Robert Coles and John Erickson of um, Father Dan Berrigan with a uh, turtleneck, you know, all, you know, just looking like the hippie that he was, saying mass with a coffee cup. So, I mean, but I saw, you see all this midrash, you see these kind of weird things written about Dorothy, and that's one reason why years after um, she was dead, in 1993 actually, I decided to write this book. And I think I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that because um, it's where I know. Um, in, we were having a um, uh, national gathering in Milwaukee, and someone said, you know, everybody that knew Dorothy is passing away. They're all going to be gone. We ought to collect the Dorothy story. So, um, Orvis Books gave me a little grant, and I started collecting Dorothy stories. Why did they ask me? does not come with the tail. Oh, okay. You know what? I'm just going to have a better chance. Okay. I had already written myself into the worker. Um, after I met Dorothy, I sort of buried my um, interest in the worker um, in my life as a married woman in the suburbs, getting my doctorate and raising my children and trying to make my, helping my husband to become a judge. But I didn't get the Catholic worker out of my craw. So, um, 
I got this brainstorm to write an oral history. Didn't know diddly about oral history. Called Stud Sturkle and um, got him on the phone right away. I mean, it's just kind of amazing. I think, you know, I just called him as soon as he was off the um, air. He talked to me. He had interviewed Dorothy Day, wonderful interview in Hard Times, and I had read that. And I had also used his work in my teaching. Um, so I asked him if I could go study with him. I said, you know, can I walk around with you and learn how to be an oral historian? And he said no. <laughs> but it was a good no. I mean, as it turns out, he's right. That's not really how you learn how to be an oral historian. So um, he asked me a couple of questions, and he decided, he said, well, you know, go for it. You'll find out if you can. So I did, and I did. And I interviewed 208 people for this book, including one who's in this room. And, um, but I've interviewed thousands more. But I learned about the Catholic worker by the people who live it. And I still think that's a really good way to learn. Anyway, this book is still selling well. It's $30 if you'd like to buy it. You can buy a Muse too on Amazon. But it's, I think, even more if you buy a new one on Amazon. So, after I wrote myself into a community, lots of things happened in my life. And I started my own Catholic worker or our own cat. She was with Dorothy then and the picketing um, and became a very dear friend of Dorothy for her life. And when Dorothy would visit Chicago, she would often stay with her. It was during World War II, of course, when Dorothy lost so many followers by being a pacifist. Um, it was a, a hard time for her, a lonely time, but also a time when her spirituality deepened. And the Catholic workers survived, so that after the World War II and the rather lonely 50s, um, I think her spirituality, uh -huh. even, I see that as kind of an intellectual time in the worker because there were some tremendous people writing for the newspaper and everything. She was all set to be support for the resistors when I met her during the Vietnam War. But I want to talk about the civil defense drills of the 50s. Does anybody remember these? Yes. Dorothy simply said, I will not leave the sun site and go sit in a basement thinking that that's going to save me from the atomic bomb. Us from the atomic bomb. When we had banned Hiroshima, um, and I think that word was, Truman was actually gleeful. That was the word that the, the newspapers were using. And she said, we need to put on sackcloth and ashes, weep and repent. repent. During the 50s, when we were supposed to save ourselves 
They're building air raid shelters. They're going down into the basements, and they would have these air raid drills. Dorothy said, no. Here's an early protest, um, this one in 56. She and Ammon Hennessy, who's one of the lights of the worker that we should have a college of complex thing at him, um, and Judith Molina of the Anarchist Living Theater, and other people, simply sat on a park bench and wouldn't go in, and were arrested and spent time in jail. Carl Meyer, who's here today, um, and I think I spoke at the complex years ago, um, remembers that. He was 19, I think? 20. 20. Working at Follett's in New York. And, um, Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble, excuse me. Oh. This is, right? Um, Carl says, I was already a pacifist and interested in the, in the ideals of voluntary poverty. I dropped out of the University of Chicago. Um, he said he'd read about the, the protest and he joined them on his third year. He decided at the last minute to join them. This is what he said. Ran out, held a cab, and told him, step on it, buddy. Walked upstairs with the Catholic worker on Christie Street. Dorothy and Hennessy were sitting there and some others. Judith Molina and her husband Julian Beck. Very relaxed and friendly kind of atmosphere with everybody chatting and talking. And then they would go out at the, at the amended time. As I recall, this is Carol, Dorothy was even knitting. Dorothy would knit all the time when people would be talking to her or when she would be listening to someone. And um, Tom Cornell, another worker, said she could sort of tell by how her knitting needle sounded if she was liking what, <laughs> she, was, what she would say. So, anyway. Um, Carl said, I'd like to go with you. And Dorothy said, well, that's fine. Yes, but a couple fine. things that we'd like you to know. One, we plead guilty. And two, we don't take bail. In other words, we stay in jail to the thing. Um, she said, if you, if you don't have to do it that way, but if you go with her group, we prefer that you do it that way. And this is Carl saying, right then, I crossed over from being a careful moderate to becoming a radical. He said he'd go with Dorothy. Dorothy didn't ask him anything else, his age or anything. So they went out, sat on the bench, and were arrested, and um, went to jail. He found out later that Dorothy and Ammon were really worried about it because he was separated from them. But it all turned out okay. And um, that is how Carl Meyer came to the Catholic Worker. And many people came to the Catholic Worker because of me, Dorothy. That's why I think her influence as a, as a personality was so great. I'm going to tell another couple stories that I think people might not know, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, and maybe in the question and answer, we can get to a little bit of the analysis of how she was important to American political life, um, how she's important. Um, for us today. But one that I researched just a little while ago was, um, and I published it in a, a, a zine, an online zine from Berkeley called Bad Subject. If you want to look it up, they do some interesting work. It's called Bad Subject, just an online magazine. Um, <coughs> JFK and his brother Joe came down to the worker sometime between, in probably early August, uh, between July 29th and August 1st of 1980. And um, they had read, <coughs> must have read about it and then read it the newspaper or something. Anyway, they just dropped in and the worker then was like really grungy. I mean, um, these two Harvard educated boys from um, Boston are coming in and 
Dorothy said right away, well, would you like to join us for dinner? And Joe said, well, we would like to take you out. <laughs> so they didn't want to eat at the worker. So they went out to dinner. Um, Dorothy was impressed enough to mention it in her diaries. And she said, we went to a little restaurant around the corner. We had a wonderful conversation and talked long into the night of war and peace and of man and the state. This was in 1940. Um, JFK had just published a thesis, finished his Harvard thesis on um, Great Britain's attempt to stay out of the uh, World War II. Um, one wonders what the world would have been like if they had continued to have long conversations with each other. Um, I wrote more about that more conjectures um, uh, in that bad subjects article. Dorothy Day lived a long life. She lived a life of ebbs and flows. When she first came on the scene and she and Peter started the Catholic Worker, they were hot. You know, the newspaper was um, was selling lots of copies. Everybody was asking her to talk. They never got very much money, but People were flocking to the New York house. People were starting houses all over. Then came the war years. Houses closed. A lot of people in the work weren't that pacifist, you know. And they and they um, went into the war. The Chicago house, um, the original Chicago house, had a lot of conflicts with that, and. Um, but there has always been a Catholic worker presence in Chicago from the very beginning. Dorothy's first talk in Chicago was, I believe, in the basement of St. Patrick's Cathedral as a, when she became a Catholic worker. Um, Carol had a house in Chicago. St. Francis' house is the oldest one going now. Sue Casa, the White Rose, was here a couple years ago. We've always had a Catholic worker presence in Chicago, but during Second World War, very problematic because of the pacifism. <laughs> and then in the lonely fifties, in the lonely fifties, Dorothy was like persona non grata. People were scared of her. The, you know, the McCarthy period was um, pretty hard on her. One of the funny things that. Um, Robert Ellsberg talks about, and I have to find this quote here because it's just precious. Um, Robert Ellsberg, who is now, has edited the diaries and the journals, and is editor of Orbis Books, so he was my publisher for this book, um, was an editor at The Worker as a young man, and this is um, Dan Ellsberg's son, so he was helping Dan, at 12, he was helping Dan copy the um, Pentagon Papers. Um, Anyway, so Robert was editor of the Catholic Worker, and he got this idea to send for Dorothy's FBI file. And it was huge, with a whole lot of redacted, redacted things, but um, there was still quite a lot in it. Mm -hmm. I, I've got to find it. I wrote it down here. <coughs> um, how. At J. Edgar Hoover described her. And, yeah. This is of what Dorothy, what J. Edgar Hoover said about Dorothy. Dorothy Day is a very erratic and irresponsible person. She has engaged in activities which strongly suggest that she is consciously or unconsciously being used by communist groups. From past experience with her, it is obvious. She maintains a very hostile and belligerent attitude toward the Bureau and makes every effort to castigate the FBI whenever she feels so insulted. <laughs> when Dorothy heard that, she roared, or she roared, but she laughed. She laughed uproariously. She just thought that was so funny. Um, and you know, she had a great sense of humor. Um, sarcastic, kind of. Uh, Here's what I heard just the other day. Somebody was um, okay. had coming out of the rain and had a, his jacket was all wet. And she said, 
don't you realize your testimony right there? And then she said, well, don't expect any sympathy. And um, he answered, well, I don't never expect sympathy. And she said, well, I never met a man who didn't. <laughs> she, had a, she had a sense of humor. Um, in her diaries, one day, she wrote, Vespers was announced, and everyone disappeared. She said, start to pray, and you can clear a room very easily. Okay, I'm going to leave, um, leave the room, I hope, for your stories, your questions. Oh, oh, you don't, oh, you don't leave the room. You just, no, 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 because you're the one that answers the questions. Yeah, yeah, they're going to answer the. They're going to ask the questions. Answer, That's right. Yeah, yeah, and then for your rebuttals as well. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Let us thank our yes. speaker. You know, this is the first time that I've heard about Dorothy Day, and you mentioned a lot about her. What is she most famous for, and why should we hear about her? Okay, did you, did you hear the question? Yeah. Dorothy Day founded the Catholic Worker Movement, a movement which unites feeding the poor with social action, action for peace, um, not only, um, well, when she was a little girl, she said, why do we always hear about the saints who feed the slaves, but why we don't hear for any, anybody trying to get rid of slavery? The Catholic worker does both things. Feeds the poor and looks at why we have so much poverty. So it's uniting social action with charity. All right, um, all right Dave, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, just as a point of curiosity, Tim? was uh, ahead, Sandra Day O'Connor named after uh, Dorothy Day? I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Who else has a yes, ma'am? Yes, uh, I was wondering, did uh, Dorothy Day have any um, interaction with second wave feminists? Like Gloria Stein? Um, um, we could talk a whole lot about Dorothy Day and feminism. Um, and I'm just going to briefly say that um, she acted like, a, in my opinion, she acted like a feminist. She was able to actualize herself and do what she wanted and get what she wanted. She was not a traditional feminist. She was very, uh, very much against the sexual liberation of the 60s. Um, she, I mean, she had such a disordered life as a young person. She just saw the, the unhappiness that she had and projected that on everybody else um, and was very essentialist as far as like who women had certain traits and men had certain traits but personally she certainly and there's been some wonderful writing on this um, she certainly was actualized as a as an independent woman okay um, Margaret yeah why is uh, the Catholic Church specifically proposing her for saint reached the yes. first level when she had such an unconventional life and in fact she had an unconventional life um, after she uh, converted to Catholicism. Well, one wonders. Um, well, well, I could what's talk. the political reason? Anyway? Yeah. Um, Cardinal um, O'Connor said he, when he proposed her in 1999, he, it was almost as if he thought if he didn't, he thought it was something he should do before he died, and he died shortly after. The cause has languished. Cardinal Dolan doesn't really want it, but in fact, there's been quite a little bit of work, and they are meeting tomorrow. The people that manage these kind of things are having a meeting actually on Monday um, in New York about it. But um, it seems to me that with the new pope, She's kind of a both sort of saint. Whether that's going to do anything, I don't know. But saints have a wildness to them. Dorothy had a wildness to her, and, and saints really do. So um, despite what they try to do to sanitize saints, I, I think, you know, she might, she'll be a saint someday. Whether wow. I'll live, I don't know. All right. Uh, okay, Bob. Uh, regarding uh, canonization of sainthood, 
Don't all saints have to perform two miracles? Do they have to perform any miracles? <laughs> all right. Um, what Bob was asking was, um, in order for one to be canonized, does not one have to have performed at least two miracles? And did Dorothy Day uh, perform any miracles? The miracles don't have to be ones you perform. Um, they need to be ones that people pray for and they perform post posthumously. Um, I'm not sure where the miracle status is. Um, Um, granddaughter Kate was it two chapters on her work for civil rights were in her one of her second or third book I guess yeah. called Boats and Fishes and the publisher made her take them out so we don't see a lot of her work in <coughs> quality because they that it wasn't published no. um, but I think she would she'd be against exclusion but she was very much pro labor for union. Yeah. So she was, you know, sometimes contradictory in her mm -hmm. attitude. All right. Um, all right. Then speaking of union members, Charlie has his hand up. Go yeah, ahead. This is there a lot of talk years ago the, about Cardinal Spellman of New York being somewhat pro-war. Did he? A lot, was there any conflict between him and Dorothy Day? Oh, yeah. Both being in New York? <laughs> Cardinal Spellman um, did not they were not on the same page in any way, shape, or form. At one time, not the Cardinal himself, but um, some of his staff asked her to take the name off the name Kathy off the journal. Mm -hmm. And um, the way she got around it showed um, what a strong and really canny person she was. First she said, well, you know, you have the Catholic veterans of foreign wars and you don't make them take their name off and they're not associated with the Catholic Church. They're just a group of Catholic veterans. She said, we're just a group of laymen and we happen to, you know, have this newspaper called the Catholic Worker. At that time they were mostly Catholic. Anyway, um, they were at various times they had threatened in some ways to close her down and she always got around it and they didn't want um, publicity basically, so they dropped off. But she also would um, tell good stories about Cardinal Spellman. 
you know, she'd tell about how he'd come down um, and give the last rites to people on the Bowery. I mean, she tried to love those that were her enemies, but I would say that Cardinal's well known. Pretty much an enemy. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. Because there's been a lot of conversation in the Catholic Worker about um, Catholic workers and our interaction with like racism and undoing oppression. Wait, you're talking too fast. Speak out. <coughs> and undoing oppression in anti-racism work, especially related to Ferguson. And I was wondering um, what Dorothy's kind of take on the Catholic Worker that Peter started in Harlem was. Um, and if, if you know, if she wrote anything about it, I haven't really, it just occurred to me. Well, I'd like to see those two chapters on civil rights, which is what we called it then, um, that were taken out of loaves and fishes. Because, and, you know, they may be available. I don't know. I've never, I just found this off of the the other day. Um, but the Catholic worker was not... It always served everybody. It was not at all exclusionary. But it did not achieve fame for work against racism. And I think, uh, particularly now, it is, you know, particularly St. Louis work. Okay. Dorothy took a very, very strong stand in favor of equal rights back in the 30s when very few Catholics and very few white people did. And always from the beginning, there was a black worker and a white worker on the Catholic worker mass with their Logo. hands clasped. Uh, yeah. so and that was, was very from, strongly okay. against right. Right. That was from a Chicago Catholic, a black Catholic worker in Chicago made that all right. suggestion. All right. Um, all right. Any, any more, any other questions? <coughs> all right. Well, I have, I have a question for you, if I, uh, if I may. First of all, I was in reading the description of the program oh, tonight. I know. Okay, this. okay. <laughs> All right, yes, that's what I wanted to ask you about, ma'am. Because um, you, you said that, no, I'm not Catholic, um, and you said here that uh, Dor Dorothy Day advanced the Catholic economic theory of distributism. Uh, now, I wanted, that's what I wanted to ask you. What is that? What is distributism? Well, I have to confess I forgot my notes on it. I'm not an economist, but basically distributism is the idea of small home um, worker owned or individually owned or family owned businesses that a uh, concept of subsidiarity or smallness rather than big it's not communism it's an alternative to communism and it's an alternative to socialism and definitely an alternative to capitalism because it <laughs> did not have the whole system of, of um, stocks and, you know. I see. So she was advocating this as an economic model as opposed <coughs> to the state ownership of socialism or the lar large right. corporations right. of capitalism. And I'm sorry, because I did have, um, I did have, I did quite a bit of research on that after I read Charles's description uh, and just don't have, I forgot to bring it with me. Um, it's connected with personalism, which is basically an ethics of engagement, and that's very central to Catholic worker philosophy. You do it yourself. You don't depend on the state to do it. Okay. Huh. All there's, right. a, there's, a, there's a definition I could read from Wikipedia real quick that might help clarify that. That would be good. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Distributism, also known as distributionism, or distributism, is an economic ideology that developed in Europe in the late 19th and earliest 20th centuries based upon the principles of Catholic social teaching, especially the teachings of Pope Leo XIII and his encyclical Reum Grand Lavarum and Pope Pius IX in Quadralissimo Anno. According to distributists, property ownership is a fundamental right and the means of production should be spread as widely as possible rather than being centralized under the control of the state, state socialism. A few individuals or corporations. Distributism therefore advocates a society based upon widespread property ownership. Cooperative economist Race Matthews argues that such a key system is a key to bringing about a just social order. Okay, um, all right now, uh, sir, did you have a question? I just want to take issue with your defining... No, 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 no hold on a, a second. Just a you can, quick no, no, comment. No, if, you did, if you had a comment to make, you can do that during the rebuttal period, which will be coming up at 8 o'clock. Whatever. <laughs> okay. 
Now, you know, uh, that uh, comment we're taking a grand total one, of one, 12 seconds. No, no, no. Longer no, than no, our no, conversation no, already. Sir, sir, this is a time for questions. All right, not I'm for sorry. Bottles. My fault. Okay, okay, but you can you can, you can can speak after. after okay, she, all right, I'm going to go ahead and see if you don't Q&A. Okay? I beg your pardon. Okay. All right. All right, I see that, Bill, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Wait, wait, before, I'm sorry to do this, Bill, but I just want to make sure that nobody else has a question that hasn't already had a chance. Okay, is anybody? Uh, no? Okay, go ahead, Bill. There was a, uh, a theory of capital accumulation for poor people, and it was mostly in the third world. I can't remember the name of it, but it was by a Mohammed Yunus, as I recall. Uh, does this... Uh, do you, do you recognize this as a form of uh, distributism? You know, I don't know enough to answer the question. Mondragon Workers Cooperative in Spain is one that Dorothy Day supported a lot as a as a um, an example of an economic system that worked. Um, family farms. The Catholic workers are. are that's the fastest growing part of the movement. Small farms where people own the means of production. A very medieval concept, basically, um, of, of small cooperative um, business. All right. Um, OK, I think if Tim's got his hand. OK, Bob, go ahead. Uh, could you please explain uh, <coughs> excuse me, further how she is an anarchist or the chief anarchist? Okay, okay, you, what your, your question, Bob, is in what way was Dorothy Day an anarchist? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, okay, did you? Okay. Um, I think she was really more a personalist. Personalism is like an ethic engagement, you do it yourself. But she was very against rules, and there's all sorts of stories about how she resisted making the Catholic worker that she had been rule bound. In other words, it was very determinately not an organization, but an organism. And she resisted. So it was a personal anarchism, I would say. I don't think it was exactly um, a political anarchism. Although she loved the word, and she frequently used it, and she definitely supported anarchism. All right. Um, other all right. I, I'd like to, be, I'll get to your question next, Ben, but I, I wanted to ask a follow-up to Bob Lichtenberg's question, I think. Because in, in your lecture, Rosalie, you said that Dorothy Day was both an anarchist yes, and a socialist. Yes, now, aren't, aren't those mutually exclusive, and aren't those different from, from distribute, distributism, is what we were talking yes. about before? I think socialism, anarchism, and dis distributism are completely different. She was an anarchist and a personal philosophy, okay. but she was not a political anarchist. In other words, she just didn't like rules. She didn't like government intervention. Um, she um, was very definitely a socialist before she became a Catholic, mm -hmm. but she saw the dangers of state socialism, I think, particularly given given the times. So so you're, what you're saying is that when she was younger, she was a socialist, but then later on, after yeah. she converted to Roman Catholicism, she, she became more like an anarchist? Is that what you're saying? A personalist. I okay, would. okay. Yeah. All right, all right. That makes sense. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. go ahead with your question. I would, I would like to know what Dorothy Day thought of things like uh, corporations, uh, Wall Street, um, what she thought about big business and was it a necessary evil, or was it a, a supposed to be maligned and not supported? It was an evil that shouldn't exist. She was very anti-capitalist. Um, there is a, a saying, and I don't have it complete, but um, she would talk about, she, I think you may have heard her saying, we have to get rid of this filthy, rotten system. What she was talking about when she said filthy, rotten system was the system of capitalism, not the government. Uh -huh. um, and I don't have the complete quote, but she said the whitened yes. sepulcher of the corporations in New York. I mean, it was quite, quite strong language, um, and I did not bring the quotation. She was very anti-capitalist. And it's one of the sad things is because she was also anti-big government, we've got a whole lot of people on the right who are always <laughs> trying to co-opt her and saying because she was against big government, she had to be pro-capitalist, and she wasn't. Okay, so, all right, all right. Um, uh, sir, did you How have a question? How did she feel about <clears throat> Eleanor, FDR, and the New Deal? 
Um, well, she was never very, she didn't consider herself political. She never voted you know, in national elections. But I would imagine she liked the New Deal a whole lot better than the old deal. Um, she did not collect Social Security. She did not pay into it. And in that, she was very anarchist. I mean, she just was really against the state as a big state. Um, but they, she, I mean, she said, she used to say, you know, do what you can and then get other people to do what you can't. And she realized that we had to have some sort of social system that we could not, with our screwed economic system, we couldn't take care of everybody by feeding them soup. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of going down to help people get SSI and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Um, all right, Charlie, did you have another question? Yeah, the Catholic Church, especially in the 30s and 40s, a pretty authoritarian organization. I, an anarchist is going to last very long. What, what is she doing? And she was a I, lay this person. Is, this doesn't work. Yeah. She was not a member of the Catholic. I mean, she was a Catholic person, church. She was a member of the Catholic Church, but she was a lay person. She was never a member of the structure. And a surprising number of priests were very supportive of Dorothy Day. The hierarchy was always scared to death of her. Mm. She was like a time bomb in their diocese because, you know, people could start to question about this pray, pay, and obey thing that, that they got every Sunday. You know, don't do anything unless Father says it's okay. Dorothy never got that. She didn't believe it. She just came and did what she wanted. And she was charming when she had to be. And I think sometimes she sort of talked her way out of sticky situations, but she never asked the bishops if she could do anything. She didn't feel she had to. Because she wasn't because she was not under the she wasn't under the authority of the of the Not Catholic in any way. She wasn't under the authority of the Catholic a, Church. She was a Catholic exactly. lay woman running a volunteer organization, didn't take money from the church. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Does, oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, did, the, did she express any opinions regarding the programs, like the Great Society, the anti-poverty <laughs> programs, the civil rights legislation, the whole machine, All right, enforcement did, did, mach yeah. machinery oh, that came the along machinery of, She was very, very much in favor of civil rights legislation and all of that. She just wasn't in favor of, of big government, but, um, you know, she personally, and she didn't write about political things. She wrote about things that people should do. Like she would never tell people how to vote, anything like that. Yeah. But she was very much in favor of equality and civil rights and, and the um, legislation that would help people. But she would, didn't see politics as what she needed to do. Okay. Um, all right. Any, any other questions at this time? All right. In that case, I, I wanted to ask a, a brief question, if I may. Uh, what has been the what has been the impact of the Catholic Worker Movement, not just in Dor from Dor Dorothy Day's lifetime, but over over the whole time of its existence? What has been the um, what kind of, what what I mean? What does the Catholic Worker what do they campaign for now, and what what have they what have they done? What have they accomplished since since she founded them? Um, I think, and of course, I'm you know giving just my own personal view. I think the, the cat impact of the Catholic worker on the Catholic Church, American Catholic Church, has been quite, um, quite a lot. In that, a lot of the things that Dorothy advocated, nuclear pacifism, equality, immigrant rights, the all of the things that people on the left in the in the Roman Catholic Church now are becoming more and more at least mouthed by the hierarchy, whether or not they're lived. The, um, uh, she's not been successful in calling the Catholic Church to simplicity, to um, divesting itself of power, of power um, which is something I think she would really want to, but I don't think the Catholic workers have been at all successful in that. Mm -hmm. The Catholic worker as, a, as an organism is much larger than it was when Dorothy um, was alive. We have about 227 houses in every, and they're in every continent but um, Asia. Mm -hmm. So it's much bigger. Okay. All right. So you think the main impact has been on, on the Catholic Church itself? And the Catholic Church changing. Um, it's not that, I and mean, when, when Dorothy started House of Hospitalities, it was like the only people that were doing that were, not very many people were feeding poor people. 
Now we've got tons of people. I mean, it's an industry. It's a whole industry. And a lot of people are doing it the Catholic Worker way. Small houses, most living with the people they serve. So I think it has a social impact. Okay. All right. Social okay. impact too. All right. Um, what do you, can you wait, define? Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me, Tim, did you, did you have I just want to ask so for clarification. Ahead. What do you mean by house? House for, of hospitality. Thank you. A house of hospitality is a place where it was a concept, um, as I said, um, uh, suggested by Peter Moran, where people give food and shelter to people who need it. Um, and the thing that's different between a house of hospitality and a shelter, which there are millions and millions of now, is that in a house of hospitality, the workers, the Catholic workers, who come as volunteers, live with people they call guests who come because they need and they live, you actually live in the house with, with the people, in, eat the same food, live in the same simplicity that the poor oh. people do. You don't go home to your fancy apartment at night. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Is there any evidence of uh, Dorothy Day's relationship with the settlement house movement? Settlement um, people? Yes, there has been some nice work done on that. Um, uh, right. Janice... Brandon Francon has done um, some work on that. Sounds like I don't think there was, um, just because of the timing, I don't think there was too much actual connection, but there are lots of correspondences. Yeah. And I, I've, got, I've got some citations I can give you. All right, are there any other questions? Uh, this time? All right, I have one more question I, I'd like to ask you, no, if there, if nobody else has a question right now. Um, you mentioned briefly that, no, this is a different that yeah. when Dorothy Day was, was still right alive and leading Catholic sale. worker, that the Catholic workers were still mostly Catholic. Uh, are you saying that they are no longer predominantly Catholic anymore? Well, you know, nobody asks, but by and large, one is sensing that Catholic worker communities are not very Catholic. Anymore. I mean, so um, the, many of the people that come to them are not Catholic. Um, when I was in the Catholic, when I had the Catholic oh, Worker House in Saginaw, at one time I was the only person that had even any sort of Catholic background. Oh. So um, we always used to say the only thing wrong with the workers is its name. Nobody's Catholic and nobody works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? No. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, let's have another warm round of applause for our speaker. All right. Now, now we'll, we'll go straight into the rebuttal period, folks. And we're starting a little early, so we got plenty of time. So, first of all, I, what I would like is um, what I'd like is a show of hands. How many people want to speak? If you want to speak, raise your hand. I'll count count the hands. And keep your hands up, folks. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, ten, eleven. What about you, Charlie? All right, I'll see. Okay, that's twelve. Okay, I'm counting twelve people. Um, so about five minutes. All right, down. yeah, five minutes each. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay, so uh, all right. So who wants to speak? Just now. Here's how it how it works. You come up here. Just come up here to the microphone and, and speak into the microphone as I'm doing now. Of course, I'm, I'm, uh, and 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 if you're waiting, you can just come over here, sit in the chair here, and uh, and and then when when you're uh, you know when 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 you get you just wait your turn. All right, here's Bill Wentz, so come on. Yeah, books for sale. Oh, boy, Bill. Okay. Um, she yeah, she's selling her books. Though. I was oh, acquainted so. with the uh, Thank you very much. Catholic yeah. Worker Movement uh, back in the 60s when I was having a big problem with the draft. And I got to Carl Myers uh, close to hospitality several times. And when I was on the lamb, from a warrant for my arrest uh, oh. on my gratifications in a uh, higher court. Tell me how to get along with the social security number, or card, get you a know, social security card so I could get a job. Uh, I very much believe in these uh, decentralized economic approaches. And I think uh, one way to that is a genuine free market. 
one without a central bank or an income tax. And John Maynard Keynes made an, a, 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 an absolutely elegant uh, statement against it and economic consequences of the peace, page, page 235, 236. Uh, said that uh, he, he cites London as saying that the quick, the best way to wreck an economy is to debauch the currency, and that inflation takes from everybody and gives it to a very small a collection. Or, or, <laughs> Uh, you know, about like the one percent today. Can you, can um, you go for me? I have to go to the bathroom. Yes, yes. Now I think the uh, most notable practitioners of this one percent uh, type of strategy is the Koch brothers, and I'm putting together uh, a letter to them. Uh, about. Uh, you know, the difference between a, f a free market and a quote-unquote free market. And uh, I, go through a I go through a bunch of references about the kind of economic approach that I've uh, been advocating for years. Uh, I guess that's about it. Okay. Just as a reminder, I'm timing, so you know I'll give you a, a quick one-minute warning. Uh, I'm Carl Meyer, and I have 57 years now in the Catholic worker movement from the time when I was 20 years old and uh, went to jail three times with Dorothy Day and Ammon Hennessy. Ammon Hennessy was a mentor to me, and, and Dorothy Day and Ammon Hennessy were my principal living mentors in the development of my whole life, and now I... Uh, uh, have a Catholic worker affiliated community in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Nashville Greenlands. For uh, 13 years, I had a house of hospitality down on uh, Mohawk Street and Oak Street in Chicago back in the late 50s and 60s. Uh, now, the reason I wanted to get up early for a rebuttal was because I think uh, Rosalie is a little shaky on the uh, uh, economic and political philosophy of the Catholic Worker Movement and with Dorothy Gay. First of all, anarchism is a form of socialism. Socialism is a, a broad uh, uh, classification of everybody who sort of believes in a, a cooperative and uh, uh, equalitarian kind of society. So you have anarchist socialism, you have communist socialism, you have uh, state socialism, you have democratic socialism, you have syndicalist socialism in which uh, the organization of society is based on the organization of labor unions, co-op workers in labor unions and labor organizations cooperating with one another and so on. And Dorothy, uh, uh, Dorothy was, and I am, and uh, Ammon was, uh, anarchist socialists in the sense that we uh, uh, we recognize with Randolph Bourne that war is the health of the state and we're totally opposed to war and a state healthy on war. Uh, uh, but we're not necessarily hostile to all government. We're also only hostile to uh, those parts of government which involve the killing and oppressing people and defending uh, the wealthy against ordinary people. Uh, so uh, it's sort of a parallel thing. Dorothy's attitude is similar to mine that we're personalists and an anarchists. We want to do things ourselves and, and organize ourselves. And Dorothy was very strongly in support of me in organizing <coughs> uh, and uh, writing about war tax refusal, income tax refusal, paying no federal income tax to the state. So we don't uh, pay or subsidize the state. We don't pay for the state. But on the other hand, we do appreciate the social programs uh, of government. Uh, 
uh, and we do appreciate the Civil Rights Act. We do appreciate the uh, Bill of Rights of the Constitution of the United States. We do appreciate Social Security and Medicare. Boy, oh boy, do I appreciate Medicare and Social Security. I'm 77 years old. So uh, Dorothy lived in a community where she had never contributed to Social Security and, and she never needed Social Security, but there's plenty of people who don't have that kind of community support or don't have support from children and families who do need Social Security. And Dorothy often, often spoke of Holy Mother the State in the sense that the government would provide services. Now, in the distributist sense, the sense of distributism as he read the definition, the idea is we believe that an ideal society is one in which economic power is distributed. It isn't centralized, it isn't concentrated, and with Thomas Jefferson we believe that this is a basis of a democratic and equalitarian society where wealth isn't, isn't concentrated. So that's what we mean by distributism and, and uh, anarchism. Yeah. Oh, one more point. The reason that Dorothy, uh, Peter, prefer, Peter also was okay with the idea of anarchism, but anarchism, since Sacco and Vanditti and so on and so forth in the 19th century, violent anarchist, Dorothy was a Kropot, Peter Kropotkin anarchist, uh, but uh, with the violent anarchism and uh, Anarchism got so many very negative connotations that sometimes you want to get rid of a word like Christianity has so many negative connotations now. Sometimes you want to have a new word that doesn't carry with it all those uh, negative connotations and you're able to define the word yourself. And that's one of the reasons we like personalism as a definition of, of our anarchism. Well, I'll do my other uh, address. It's a little hard to get to. Yeah, yeah I'll give it to you. Uh, I uh, disagree that uh, that uh, uh, war is the lifeblood of uh, of the state. Uh, that's only true in a socialist state. In a capitalist state, war is the worst thing for the state. And Anne Rand points out that war throws gyrations of, uh, of uh, inflation through the financial system, and that's bad for capitalism. So uh, stability is the best thing under a capitalist system. Uh, I don't uh, agree that uh, we should give to the poor. Uh, in my opinion, I uh, think the poor should be destroyed. <laughs> what? Uh, All right. Kill them. Uh, oh. Kill them. Kill them. Excuse hey, one, one me, please. Time. One fool at a time. I talk. never advocated killing anyone. And I think the poor should be destroyed in another sense. I think they should be destroyed in the sense <coughs> that if you take a poor person, and uh, an organization takes him and says, look here, we're going to fix it up for you to be a balloon salesman, and we're going to give you the money to buy the balloons and so forth and set you up and then show you for a period of time how to put so much aside to replenish your balloons and to eat and so on and do this, and you'll become a productive person and eventually be able to even hire someone and make your operation grow, it gives the man dignity as well as having destroyed him as a member of the poor. And if we can destroy as many of the poor as possible that way by setting them up in small uh, business operations where they can grow, uh, that is, uh, I think, a much better way of dealing with helping the poor than in uh, 
than in perpetuating the poor by giving them a handout. I'm very much in agreement with the concept, the Chinese concept, that if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man how to fish, he's fed for his lifetime. That, to me, sounds very much like the ideal. Also, I want to say that uh, this concept of distributism uh, sounds to me very much like the ideal of capitalism that I believe in. This thing of, cro of what they call crony capitalism uh, and uh, uh, cor big corporations that are super big that uh, want to uh, be monopolists okay, is hardly what capitalism is about. Capitalism is much more on the basis of many people having businesses with some people working for them, or even a lot of people working for them. But it's not about uh, the McDonald's's or the Procter & Gamble's or the General Motors or whatever. Uh, and, by the way, it leads into a further game that the government is very complicit in. It, it was no accident that the federal government helped uh, bail out General Motors by giving them billions of dollars. If you looked closely at big super corporations like General Motors, they pay tremendous amounts of money to the government every year. So if the government uh, if they folded, if they were allowed to, to die, to fail, as should be in a capitalist system, then the government wouldn't get any more money. So the government just wants to keep perpetuating the flow of the money. Well, that's really about all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, I never heard of the uh, dark day I ever, when I listen to the speaker, you sound like a person that I want to be. Now, the gentleman stole some of my <laughs> speech here, but I got to repeat it because this was part of, uh, of my uh, rebuttal. And that is, the official version is never something that I accept because the official version is always being pushed by the government or society. I'm a, a type that think the individual is the highest entity when you talk about this and that. Now, for individual, if you like me and Dorothy today and others, the individual know the two entities that he has to overcome. One of them is government. And if you are anti-government like me, you're an anarchist. The other energy that you got to overcome to be what Dorothy Day, I think she is, and what Gene Anderson is, is society. I don't need society, and I don't need the government. And thank you, ma'am, because Adam said I was an anarchist at this podium. Few, uh, quite a few times, and I never heard the word personal anarchist. And that's almost perfect because if you listen to the official version, the, the governor gonna tell you Sarko and Vincente is an anarchist. And that word become a substitute for a person, for a thing, an idea, and so forth, which should never be. An anarchist is personal. An anarchists don't need no government society to tell them or her nothing. There have been a whole bunch of anarchists, and they wouldn't been said it in soccer. To me, David Thoreau is anarchist. <coughs> to me, when I went through southern Illinois and Ohio, uh, uh, the Amos people is an anarchist. Buddha was a pr impressed. His father was a king, I guess, and he's a prince. 
And guess what? Buddha said, y'all can have all of this. Forget my father. Forget all of that. And he went out in the woods. Why? For the same reason I am a pushner and I kiss. I don't need nobody to light up behind. I need somebody to leave me alone. I need Big Brother to leave me alone. I'm no threat to Big Brother, and I'm no threat to society. So who that I, who is a threat? I'm like Spinoza. Spinoza said his that his to uh, annihilator that set traps for the many and call them states. And I agree with that because government ain't never did nothing right in the history of the world. All you got to do is read your history book. Oh, or be old enough like me. Okay, next speaker, please. Wisdom before being played. I'm sorry. I'd be right there. I have to give up on Now you do too. Beautiful. Okay, Brown. All right, so I met Dorothy Day sometime in the 50s. I remember Evan Hennessy. He came to my high school uh, in, in uh, Manhattan, uh, Stuyvesant High, it was on East 15th Street at that time. And uh, I had, was living in Brooklyn, but uh, uh, the school was in Manhattan. And uh, Adam Hennessy came to our history society. Uh, and our <laughs> history class, and, uh, and talked Sorry. about being uh, uh, an anarchist or being a, uh, an independent sort of person and uh, taking responsibility for, uh, for the world that you meet. Uh, feeding the hungry uh, and doing good and dis distributing, uh, sharing what you got. Uh, and, and I saw that in the Catholic worker as well as many other places. So people do share a lot, sometimes willingly and sometimes a little coerced, but uh, you know, and I remember uh, last week uh, at a Bible study at uh, a convent, a uh, uh, very Episcopal convent, <laughs> Anglo-Catholic convent. The, uh, uh, this guy came in and uh, he said, you know, I'm you know, living in a... Uh, a basement, no window, uh, it's an abandoned house, and I've uh, just gotten a, a, a job, uh, uh, and I, you know, but I, I don't have car fare to get to work in the back, uh, and, you know, and you know, in the, the usual spiel. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this little Bible study uh, group that uh, evening at uh, the convent uh, dug into his pockets and the sisters came up with uh, uh, some dough and uh, so did some of the rest of us. Uh, some of us didn't have it. <laughs> uh, but uh, to do good and to distribute is well pleasing to God. You know, it's it's just being faithful to the spirit that you've got in you. And that's why personalism is so much more than <coughs> the the systems that one builds of society, market systems and uh, the kind of <coughs> Uh, taxations or uh, so all the, there are all ways of 
<coughs> ordering your your family, your household, your relationships. And, but if you let God move you, you let the the world God speak to you. Uh, and uh, are sensitive to the injustices that you see that are hurting people, uh, then maybe you'll build a hospi hospitable household. I remember being put up one night uh, after a meeting at the Catholic Worker. We had meetings on Christie Street and then on Second uh, Street uh, uh, when they turned out the Christie Street house to build the Second Avenue uh, subway that never got built. <laughs> uh, another story, that's the destruction of housing and, and uh, the real estate uh, finaglers uh, that uh, uh, want to raise the, the rents. Now, uh, we have the same sort of thing going on here in Chicago uh, with the uh, CHA. Uh, it's perennial. But uh, Dorothy, you know, oh, uh, Cardinal Spellman. Cardinal Spellman, uh, as a, a, a what was he before that? Uh, before he became Cardinal, he was mm. Blue Jay? Monsignor. Okay. Uh, Monsignor. Anyway, okay. he was. Uh, uh, he was. Okay. Okay. He was a ray. He was well his way up. When I was in the end, a, 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 a Protestant. Okay. Uh, yeah. Going to the Catholic worker. Uh, Dorothy told me. Uh, you know, look, Catholic, no. no. Protestant, it's, it's, okay. uh, the, the Catholic worker would have disappeared. All right, uh, all right, that's a good point. Let's have a warm round of applause. Yeah. 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 Good evening. I used to be Alfred Hitchcock. I am no longer. <laughs> I've heard socialism referred to this evening as state ownership of socialism. I do not buy that term at all. My definition of socialism is perfect economic equality. And that, I mean that by all 7 billion people on the planet. I've heard a lot of trumpeting about property ownership. I don't get that. Heard a reference to Ayn Rand. Her name's Ayn. I'm anti-Christian because my favorite book is Nietzsche's book, The Antichrist, in which he critiques Christianity as a religion. However, I still have occasion to have great respect for Christians. <laughs> Somebody has mentioned the Chinese proverb, give a man a fish and he eats for, for a day, teach him how to fish, and he can eat for a lifetime. In which oceans exactly is he going to mm. fish? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm no expert on the Christian Gospels. Uh, but I do believe there's some verse in Acts in which it alludes to the common ownership of all property. Uh, somebody has referred to the ideal of capitalism. No such beast exists, <laughs> at least not one that has a future. It might have been good for its time, but that time is long past. Um, the gentleman mentioned the big fan of Thoreau too, but I disagree with you about government. I think we need government, but good government, not corrupt government like we have now. Uh, somebody has alluded to the GM bailout, General Motors. Big difference between the General Motors bailout and the bailout of the Wall Street dice tossers. And that GM produces something, and there were hundreds of thousands of jobs at stake there. With the bailout of the financiers, which was an exponent of the bailout of GM, there was about a handful, maybe five or seven people, that benefited from that. And once again, brother, you mentioned being anti-government. And then I would ask you, what about the governments like Bolivia and Venezuela and the other governments of the Bolivarian Revolution 
that are standing up to the bully of the North. <laughs> Thank you. In reference to the government of Bolivia, they have since adopted some capitalistic principles. Their president right now is running for an unprecedented fourth term, and they were one of the most economically malaised countries in South, South America for a while. Once he brought some terms of monetary stability to that country, it is now prospering. Now, you know, it, 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 always, it always amazes me how much you guys malign our corporations, malign Wall Street, and malign the modern corporation because those structures are inherently cooperative. You have to have a group of people together to get a charter going for a common purpose. Exploitation. Like anything else, though, they can be exploited. But the structure itself and our modern system of economic capitalism has proven itself to be the best way to get rid of poverty. Why do I say this? Because in the last 300 years ago, everybody was poor. The Industrial Revolution, Particularly now, the information revolution has produced far more jobs and far more uplifting of people's economic well-being than any social program that I could ever believe in. The, one of the fundamental reasons why I'm a market capitalist is because it does produce jobs. It does produce wealth. Implemented <laughs> properly under a good system of, of regulatory guidance, it can be the greatest engine of wealth production in the world. We saw it in the 1990s and early 2000s. And the only reason we had an economic collapse was because the fundamentals of capitalism collapsed. You have to have a true valuation of your assets in order to buy that asset. And when those true valuations are lied about, people don't trust you anymore. And that's the fundamental reason why our system collapsed. Mortgages were in, were, were misvalued and sold as a lie. Mortgage brokers were well, in the Mike, 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 one pull at a time. Mike, one pull at a time. He said the naughty word. Mike, Mike. My, <laughs> my point is, is that the system of trust broke down. And that's why we had our economic malaise. Now, you wonder if a cooperative organization can really do something. How many of you know about the governance organization of the Internet? The RFCs, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and other things? It doesn't have a formal governing structure, but yet people all over the world agree. It is my own opinion that Vincent Cerf did far more to help the world than this uh, person we've been talking about all, the, you know, she may have done a lot of good, but people like Tim Berners-Lee and Vincent Cerf, I believe, should deserve the credit that they get too for bringing this new economic engine and up, up, bringing this cooperative venture forward. Remember, the Taliban, when they send an email, use the same protocols as the United States government as so does our CIA, as every corporation, and you who block. You're still under the same rules and governance of PCPIP, which has been fundamentally agreed to by everybody. The long and short of it is, I believe in a free market. I believe in capitalism. I believe that it's still our best way forward to bring about economic prosperity and jobs to the world. But, like anything else, when you get corrupt officials involved, corrupt, corrupt corporation leaders, and things get a little out of skew, that's when people get mad. I don't think that people are fundamentally against capitalism, but they're against the raw deal. And in a lot of cases, I think some of our workers and people around the country are getting a raw deal. That's why I believe in capitalism. And remember, an economic system does not bring happiness. That still only comes from you with the, with the presence 
of what's in your own human heart. Capitalism can bring food, bread, and maybe a little bit of prosperity to the table to help make life a lot easier. But you cannot fundamentally be happy without some form of internal code that you live by. Thank you. I couldn't resist when I hear so much BS. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, we um, are definitely destroying our own home. This is the planet that we live in, and we are screwing it up uh, with the forces of whatever may, uh, economic system that we are living now. Okay. We use the earth as our dumping ground. Uh, now it's going on on fracking, and you don't know this, but our uh, legislators, in their wisdom, they allow now, when you do the fracking, you use these liquids that you pump in the ground and then take them out and so on. These liquids come loaded with radioactivity. And so, in order to make it cheaper for the corporation, they are dumping these radioactive materials in your municipal dams and municipal water, violating the Clean Water Act, <coughs> violating the rights of any human being to live in a clean environment. But in order for the profit motive, some uh, corporations are, have the ability to buy the conscience of our legislators and uh, we end up with a polluted environment and polluted for a long time. We are talking about thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, at the same time, when they were trying to convince us that running the nuclear power plants that they will be able to dispose of to the waste material that lasts for hundreds of thousands of years after they run the plant, uh, they built the this Yucca Mountain repository and they right told there, everybody right that right would be a good place. I and uh, at the same okay. time that they were building this thing, there were earthquakes that destroyed the buildings where the workers kept the equipment on the door of Thank the you. Yucca Mountain thing. Yes, Lana. They insisted on having the thing continue to build, and then just to run a test, they dump water in there and it ran right out. So they were saying that it was impervious to uh, migration. There are some people who couldn't shut up. That's, uh, I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, you're sorry. You no, 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 listen, no arguments. Let's just one, yeah. let Frank talk now. Okay? Right, right, right. right. Yeah. It's Frank's turn. Right, sorry. But in any way, that we are living in a period of the earth okay. that we destroy in the sea. Um, you have heard me before that I mentioned how much plastic shit we dump into the sea every day. 2,500 tons of plastic shit goes into the sea every day, about a billion tons a year. It's changing the chemistry of the sea by releasing hormonal uh, mimics into the environment, uh, modifying the uh, development of uh, life on the, on the sea. Um, it, is, it is horrendous what we, should, what we do in, in the name of capitalism. This is, this is really bad. This is really bad. It's no excuse to this. I don't care what religion you believe, this one or that one. I don't have one religion. but. Uh, if you don't respect the home that everybody, all life on earth lives, the miracle of life, the incredible miracle of life, can you observe the animals operating in their environment, how that evolved, how that is magnificent, but we don't have no respect for any of that. All right. Um, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Let's see. Um, let's anarchist defined for this woman and her associates at the time was when they were anarchists because the government took the side of the capitalist as opposed to working for the people or the workers. 
So they were anarchists and opposed to government, not government in general, but government that acted in the best interest of a particular party, somewhat like you see the Republicans today. They didn't have some nebulous thing against authority, just authority that was used against them arbitrarily and capriciously. So that's, and that was the definition going back to 1900 to this period. Um, socialism, they has never advocated warfare. This is an old thing that they've always said that uh, one worker should not shoot another worker. And socialism, I, I'm not aware of ever advocating war. I'm intrigued to learn that the libertarians are opposed to war because it causes problems with their monetary policy and results in inflation. It has nothing to do with the fact that people might get hurt in the process, but it disrupts our economy. Uh, I got to be careful here. I won't say anything about Catholics. I, my, my companion Lois is a devout Catholic, so I picked on her for years. And she <laughs> took it very quietly. I still pick on Doug, though. He's fair game. <laughs> <laughs> but he's my pal. No, they're doing good work. And um, this thing about um, scabs, I, I don't think they're Catholic worker necessarily focused on the organized labor movement and it, okay since we're talking religion here somewhat um, it, a scab play crosses the picket line because they have their own personal interest exceeds the interest of the community and I don't perceive how anyone from a religious perspective can take the side of a scab who places themselves above and are, and are more important than the community. If anything, it's just the opposite. Now regarding fish again, <laughs> teaching you how to fish, I'm a bit of a historian. The other day I came across the fact that on the eastern coast of the Newfoundland up there, there used to be cod fisheries. And um, so much so they said you could walk on the waters. And the French were there early in the beginning um, to do nothing. They were there to settle. They were there to, to fish. And they fished that out in 100 years. It took 10,000 years to build up those stocks of fish. And in less than 100 years, those fisheries were depleted. And that's why you don't even hear about them today. They don't exist anymore. Actually, they, they made the fish because the Catholics had no meat on Friday and things like that. But I won't get into that. But no, uh, regard, that's how capitalism regards the environment. You've got to watch it. And most of all, uh, again, let's thank our speaker. And since uh, we if you want an objective analysis, of the capitalist system in operation on December 13th. I've just finished it. I took the, it seems like a, a little lighthearted theme. <laughs> who makes our Christmas gifts and who sells them to us? And I'll give you the data of what's going on in the capitalist system. And if you can come away with that, Tim, I welcome you. I'm we'll, going to pay your three bucks to show up. That we'll, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be ready for you, Charlie. <laughs> Anyhow, but thank you again, Rose. It was very good. Thank you. Hold on. We got a couple more. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is James. I've never been to one of uh, your meetings here before, but Rosalie invited me to come. I'm a Catholic worker. Yeah. So. Uh, I wanted to say I love the motto of your group, one fool at a time. <laughs> I think it's a motto that Dorothy Day would have loved because more than once she said that Catholic workers are fools, are fools for Christ. I think she said, I think she would have said that, um, you know, we're, we're told that if you if you don't follow the rules of how our society works, it's a little foolish. And she said, she'd probably say, yeah, it is, but that's okay. We can all be fools together. Um, 
We've been talking, a lot of people have been asking about anarchism and what is her philosophy of anarchism. And I'm not sure she ever really defined it. But for the Catholic worker, anarchism is more than just an ideology or a philosophy. It's something practical. It's something tangible. It's about a relationship between communities and between people. Um, she believed in the decentralization of society. She didn't like the bigness of everything, the bigness of healthcare, the bigness of education. She thought everything should get smaller, more accountable to communities. Um, and it hasn't come up about how Catholic worker communities actually run. These are the anarchist communities. So who, who runs these anarch uh, anarchist <laughs> communities? Dorothy Day was like a, the queen of the anarchists. Uh, she was kind of in control of the Dorothy Day Catholic worker. But m the vast majority of Catholic worker communities are not run by leadership. They're run by consensus. Everyone in community has an equal say. And there is no overarching structure of the Catholic worker movement. Every Catholic worker is independent. Anybody can start a Catholic worker. If you're inspired by Dorothy Day, you can start a Catholic worker community. Um, and there's something beautiful about that because it's just a platform. The Catholic worker is just an idea. It's a structure that anybody can take up and use for any need that any community has. There are Catholic worker communities that 100% of their work is for refugees. There are Catholic worker communities that are 100% of their work is for feeding the homeless. Catholic worker communities that they're 100, what they do is civil disobedience. Any need that a community has can be addressed through this very loose framework. It's not rigid. It's, it's supposed to be loose so that it can be useful, so that it can be practical. Thank you, Mayor. I took the two um, Thank you very much. This, this uh, question came up about how do, we, how do we destroy poverty? How do we get rid of poverty? And Peter Warren, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker, had a very definitive answer about how we end poverty. He says that in capitalism, everyone wants more. Everyone's trying to get richer and richer. And he says the solution to capitalism is we all have to be poor. Everyone should be struggling to be poorer and poorer. Voluntary poverty, voluntary poverty, is one of the core tenets of the Catholic worker movement. We should all, they say we should all live simply. We don't need all the excess of capitalism. Um, how do you solve homelessness? That was one of the big issues that historically the Catholic worker has dealt with. And there are many options. We can, we can try to elect people that are going to build homeless shelters. We can give our money to nonprofits that help the homeless. There are lots of options. The Catholic worker option was open your door and let the homeless people in. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a very obvious solution, but it requires personal sacrifice. And that's a core part of the Catholic worker movement. Sorry, is that yeah. it's really difficult, but it requires us to give ourselves. Um, so, oh, and we brought up uh, about, uh, isn't it somewhere in the Gospels about Christians giving up all their possessions? And all, or, and it is. Common ownership, I think, is a term. Uh, yeah, it was a common ownership. The early Christian community was full of people who gave up all of their money, all of their possessions, sold everything. Individuals, couples, families, they gave it all up. Christianity has a rich, rich history of social structures that aren't anything like capitalism. Um, and that's what the Catholic Worker was about. It was restoring this beautiful, beautiful com communal vision uh, within Christianity. Thank you. <laughs>
came out uh, last week. It's a Censored 2015, and it has a lot of articles in here talking about the philosophy of where we are, of what we've been talking about tonight. I would highly recommend all of you, you can only buy two books a year other than hers, buy one of these. Uh, I'm not selling books, I'm just saying this came out, you can get it on the internet, it's called Censored 2015, and there's a fantastic quote here, page 147, it says, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. <laughs> That's from uh, Dresden James, a British novelist. Uh, the American media has been lying to us for 40 years on a lot of things. Uh, there's an old saying, um, when you're riding a dead horse, you have to get up and change horses. <laughs> I am totally in agreement with Frank tonight. Frank hit it right on the head. <clears throat> we are at a tipping point. Naomi Klein uh, wrote this book, just published, came out a couple weeks ago, called This Changes Everything. And it describes where we are as a humanity at, at the crossroads. We're right at the tipping point. We're going to go over the edge into environmental chaos if we don't go toward the light and more enlightened programs that help people without destroying the planet. David DeGraw, he's got a website called daviddegraw.org, I think it is. He wrote this book called The Economics of Revolution. It just came out it describes how there's 213 million full-time people, workers in America, that need a job full-time, and there's only 106 million full-time jobs in America. So uh, we need, Naomi Klein says, the climate change problem, the climate problem should be looked at as not a problem to solve so much as a big opportunity to solve our broken economic system. When you're talking about the, we had a speaker talking about the benefits of libertarian economics, the benefits of Ayn Rand, her teachings, the benefits of unregulated capitalism. Uh, talking about the benefits of these, you know, unregulated capitalism, free market economics with no regulations, to me, that's like talking about the scenic drive that happened going through uh, Dallas uh, 40 years ago, where you say, well, other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was your trip to Dallas? <laughs> yeah, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? If the people, if you talk about the benefits of Ayn Rand's testimony, I mean, um, philosophy, is you have to be stupefyingly ignorant about real-world economics, real-world things that affect people. Uh, you know, and the censored news books, uh, this project's been up and running for 37 years, Project Censored. It says, if you're going to learn what's going on in the world, shut off the major media and start looking at alternative sources that are really telling the truth. Now more than ever, we are living in a bubble of mythology. Uh, what Phil, uh, Phil Rockstro wrote an article called about America. He said, we live in a, a Disneyland of militant ignorance. <laughs> People are uh, militantly ignorant about certain kinds of reality, and they will attack you if you try to bring a fact to the table. Uh, uh, some people are immune to facts. They just go on believing uh, the total myth after the facts have been published by everybody. I call that flat earth ignorance in a modern society. So um, I can't recommend enough that you know, these two books especially uh, are among, out of the hundreds of books I've digested in the last five years, The Economics of Revolution and This Changes Everything are two of my top ten because they describe both the problem and the solution. Uh, I'm a seventh grade science coach in my spare time. I help out at Science Olympiad and we teach seventh graders. The first thing we teach seventh graders is in order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem and then correctly identify the solutions. All right. If you don't, if you don't acknowledge a problem, then you can't find any solutions. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
you guys know it's in the ignorance. I have heard bantered about tonight the saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. I, the, to me, the meaning of this means is, well, instead of just helping someone survive, teach him a way to live. I had the saying proposed to me at one time. I'm still waiting for my lessons. <laughs> so if you're going to say it, you better have something to back it up with. You better be ready to teach that person how to survive rather than just tell them, well, you need to find something to do to make your living. And number two, my main objection to that saying is, well, what if the poor guy starves before he learns his field? Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to have some random thoughts here to share with you. Uh, regarding Dorothy Day, uh, especially sainthood, uh, I don't know if you know this, but tomorrow uh, Pope Francis is going to be by Pope Paul VI in uh, Rome. And I guess there's several stages you go through to become a saint. I don't know if I have the right ones here, but the first stage is beatification, which is going to happen to uh, Paul VI tomorrow. Then I think the next stage is you're determined to be vulnerable. And then finally you reach the full level of sainthood. I guess if there's two miracles that can be attributed to people praying to you in, in the afterlife that can be verified and uh, I guess get, that gets you into the door. Of course, I feel like there's a lot of unsung saints in heaven. I feel like my parents are there. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that, you know, yeah, I, I really was sad to hear that Dorothy Day had an abortion during her lifetime. She fits in there with Thomas Merton. I know Rosalie goes to the Thomas Merton group I go to. And he's another flawed guy where he had a baby out of child uh, wedlock. And he became a, uh, a monk and a priest. And uh, he's well read these days. He did a lot of writing. And um, so I think, uh, in a way, uh, Dorothy Day, uh, you know, kind of follows that mold. She certainly had a lot of interesting thoughts. And my thoughts on this poverty thing is that, you know, we, we talk about selling off your wealth. Well, really, what I, I think more or less what, you know, the Christ version of wealth possession is that it should be shared. Uh, in the second reading, uh, or the second Sunday of, or I'm sorry, the first reading of the second Sunday of Easter, when they asked the apostles, they talked about how the original early Christian community sold the people that had wealth sold off their property, but then what they did is they redistributed, it sounds familiar, uh, among the people of the have-nots so that everyone would not go for one. And I think that's essentially, you know, in the first beatitude what Jesus says that, you know, uh, to, uh, that people should have a spirit of, well, uh, poverty. Uh, the other thing is, is I want to mention, while well, it's in my thought, that there is a picture of Dorothy Day uh, in the basement of uh, St. Peter's downtown in the, what they call the St. Clair Auditorium. If you ever get down there, you look to the right wall. Uh, it's not a portrait of her, but it's a, a fairly good characterization of what she looked like in her later years. Uh, and I believe there is a Catholic worker house close to us here in Uptown. Uh, Kenmore Street, is that right? Yeah. Francis, we mentioned it. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's near, nearby, you can get there if you get to uptown. Walk uh, down Kenmore, I think, going north, going north or south? 4752. 4752. So you go south from Lawrence, and uh, you can uh, get to the worker house. It's on the right side of the street as you're going south. Um, so at any rate, uh, that's all I have to say, and uh, I think in a way, you know, one of these things about the pacifism of war is that, you know, some people, really, there is such a thing as a just war. And, you know, at the time we were talking, talking about the nuclear bomb, how it killed thousands of people, but at the same time, and we talked about, you know, how 
Truman kind of smiled when he heard that, that the bomb did go off effectively. The thing is, is we could have been fighting World War II until 1950s. Oh, right, both. Yeah, because um, um, you know how tough the islands were, and it would have taken a long time to overcome that country, you know, if we did, you know, house to house. So uh, it kind of brought a quick end and saved some lives uh, in the process. You know, we lost a well, total count for the whole war was about 57 million. And the other thing I want to mention is that people are going to die somehow, some way. So even though some people die suddenly and unexpectedly, the fact of the matter is that, you know, in a hundred years after the war or whatever, it doesn't matter a whole lot of beans uh, who lived or died because everyone's dead anyhow. Thank you. Here comes your attack on the Catholic Church. All right. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, the early Christian Church meets all the criteria of a cult, as noted by the Cult Awareness Network, um, and you can look that up. Uh, the Catholic Church is a political animal, and I okay. it, 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 they have to have some real serious political reason, which doesn't have anything to do with what Dorothy Day actually did or what she actually felt or anything else, but using her for their own political purposes, in my um, opinion. Uh, Machiavelli always told, uh, told the leader that he needed to use religion to control the, the masses of people. And certainly that's been done by the church here. And the church has always been, the Catholics have always been a minority in this country. Protestants have always been the majority uh, thing. So the Catholic church has always been attuned to the needs of immigrants because that's one of the very few ways that they were able to replenish their membership. And now the number of <coughs> Catholics are, is decreasing for a variety of reasons, including the pedophile scandal. And, um, and, the, and the only way that the church is actually increasing in membership here is the um, immigration of people from Latin America and Mexico that's, um, are, that come in at least nominally as Catholics. And that's uh, the only way that the church has kept up its numbers. And so that's why they support immigration, not really any serious reason. Um, she, it's really stunning that, um, I, I don't understand it. You know, you talked about her, that it was okay, with, that, that, that she really wasn't under the control of the church because she was a lay member. And that, of course, is total bullshit because um, the church really tried to control everybody. They uh, talked the Boston police into closing a, an auditorium that Margaret Sanger was going to speak in. That was a public speech that they'd arranged. They contracted with the auditorium. They paid the what deposit or whatever, and the uh, Boston police padlocked it, and they were under the control of the Boston bishop. So, and, and Margaret Sanger wasn't even Catholic. So, um, Oh, I, I take it back. She was Irish. I take it back. She was Irish. So her family was Catholic. She left the church, as you might imagine. Um, at any rate, um, so that, you know, that's that the church didn't have any control over her because she's a lay member. It's just, it's really not being aware of the situation at all. So then, um, Let's see here, and of course I have to, uh, I, you know, I just think that there the reason for doing this is, is very political in terms of the, uh, of her sainthood, and that it, it, they, they did the same thing with the Virgin of Guadalupe, they recognized that apparition because they needed another icon for the indigenous people here, they didn't have any indigenous icons for the people to, uh, um, worship and so they really had to bring in something so that's why they recognized the Virgin of Guadalupe so they used that and I have to say something about the, the fish and that is that you know when you have a poor five-year-old you're not going to teach him to sell balloons 
I have a new spot on the front lines. And 20% of children or 25% of children in this, in this country are, are live in families that are below the poverty line. You also really do not teach an 85-year-old guy who's all crippled up with arthritis to sell balloons either. Or someone who's senile, like I'm getting, that, you know, that they can really you know, sell bubble gum or something. I mean, please. Fish from all right. the rich. Okay. Okay. I think they should all be right. The fish and the rich have too many fish. <laughs> no, I ain't gonna talk. I ain't allowed to talk. You're not allowed. Dude. What? No, I'm a naughty boy. Oh. 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 Yeah, Mike, we've been waiting all this time. Oh. No, I'm not allowed to talk. That's part of the program. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Does anybody else wish to give a rebuttal speech? Uh, all right. In that case, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take about take five minutes. Tim, can you give me a one minute warning, please? Yes, I will. All right. Um, all right. This has been a very interesting program tonight. Um, Would you like more water? Now, um, uh, it's uh, hearing about Dorothy Day. This is a person about whom um, I had been hearing. I actually. When I was, um, I'm not, as I mentioned before, I'm not Catholic, but I did actually go to a Catholic college. And, uh, and, and, and when you go to, at this college, they required you to take a course in religious studies, and I did, uh, and I did do this. It was a course called, uh, that was recommended to me by my, uh, by my academic advisor called Justice, Peace, and Liberation. Yeah. It, now, in those days, I was a libertarian, so this sort of thing really was not my cup of tea, and I only ended up getting a C in the class. Oh. But um, I remember that we were given a list of, top of people we could write, uh, write biographies on as part of the class project. And one of the people on the list was Dorothy Day, a person I'd never heard of before. And then I heard bits and pieces about her later on over the next um, several years. And, and then I found out that uh, my landlord, who, uh, Bradford Little, who's here with us tonight, had, um, had heard about her. And um, I'm, I'm frankly, I'm surprised that Brad didn't want to give, her, give a speech tonight. Uh, if you want to talk after me, Brad, you certainly uh, may do so. We've got enough time. Yes. Uh, and um, now, I heard of, as usual with the college during in the Q and A and the rebuttals, we kind of got broader and went way beyond just talking about Dorothy Day and getting into discussions of big issues like what is socialism, what is anarchism, what is capitalism, uh, and what is libertarianism. And the only thing I can conclude from these, from these, the, the all of this is that everybody, there's no consensus on what any of those words mean. Everyone who has, has an opinion on the subject seems to have their own definition. And the definitions of the, that I hear from people about socialism and anarchism and capitalism are mutually exclusive of each other. So my conclusion is that these words are basically meaningless. They mean whatever people want them to mean. They're, they're just arbitrary labels. Um, and now I did, I, I noticed that um, I guess somebody already covered that. Uh, Tim, you said tonight that uh, 300 years ago everybody was poor. I would have to disagree with you. The rich 300 years ago were not poor. So they were only a small number of people. They were 1% or so. Yeah, the 1%. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Now, on, on the subject of scabs, Charlie, I mean, you expressed your, your hostility to the scabs, but I would say that a person, uh, scabbers, they're called in the, in the business replacement workers, uh, may just be a guy that, that needs a job and needs something to eat. Um, uh, perhaps better than, than can, if, you're, if, if you are trying to organize workers, uh, perhaps the solution would be rather than to condemn scabs, but to try and get them, get them to join up. Oh, please join us. Okay, now, now on the subject of World War II and Japan, I, uh, now I would have to correct uh, Doug on this subject. Uh, the war could not, the war with Japan could not have lasted till 1950 because in 1945 Japan was on the verge of collapse. For example, in the Battle of Okinawa, they sent their, their best battleship, the Yamato, to the battle, but it only had enough fuel for a one way trip. Um, Japan, in fact, was looking for a way to negotiate out of the war. 
and, and had approached the Soviets to do so, but the Soviets did not, since the Soviet Union was not yet at war with Japan, even though it was a member of the Allies, but the Soviets did not forward that information to us soon enough. Um, now, I would, uh, now, Margaret, you said that Protestants have always been a majority in the U.S. That is, that was true, but it's no longer because, because Protestants now make up less than 50% of our population. They, they still outnumber Catholics, but they are no longer the majority of Americans. No, they don't. No. Yes, ma'am. No, they still, they still I, I, excuse me, Doug, one fool at a time, all right? Now, uh, now, now, also, now, second, Dorothy is not a, now the idea that, when I said before, and I think also Rosalie said that Dorothy Day was not under the control of the Roman Catholic Church, although she was a Catholic layperson, uh, and, and, and I think what Rosalie is saying, am, am I out of time yet or no? No. Okay, one minute, all right. That the, the cat, unlike a priest, or, 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 a, or a monk, or a nun, the Catholic Church could not fire or defrock her or, or transfer her to Kansas. That, that's all I meant. And now I just want to say one last thing on the subject of fishing. Um, if, you, if you feed a... I, I agree with, with David up to a point. If you, feed a, if you give a man a fish, you fed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he'll spend all day down by the lake drinking beer. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, I just didn't have an impulse to speak initially, because after Rosalie had spoken and Carl, who uh, knew Dorothy better than I and had studied her more, uh, I thought that the subject had been pretty well covered. Uh, however, I do have a few comments. I did know Dorothy. Uh, I met her a few times. Uh, I was immediately impressed by her size. She was a large woman. And she seemed to have a great deal of energy and an exceptional intelligence. Uh, she was eloquent. She was a wonderful writer. Uh, my evaluation, basically, is here's one of those super people that you encounter from time to time in your life. And it wasn't too surprising to me that she had such a great influence on people. Uh, she. Uh, together with Peter Morin, created a religious movement, which was probably the closest thing to Christianity that I've encountered, um, which I admire very, greatly. Uh, she inspired great numbers of people, uh, young people particularly, and I have worked with many of them in the peace movement, and I cannot help but be enormously impressed by their courage and their commitment, and the excellence of their general values. Um, I don't know that, uh, that I, this question of sainthood, I, I was a little bit surprised that the discussion of Dorothy took place all evening without anyone mentioning the, the great comment which Dorothy made when she, uh, somebody asked her about uh, what she thought about the movement for the canonization of Dorothy Day. And she said, well, I, I just hope my life isn't trivialized to that extent. <laughs> okay. All right. Speaker gets the last. Okay. Anybody else who wants to uh, comment? Anybody else who wants to comment? Our speaker then gets the last word. Let's welcome our speaker right. for the last word. How long do I have to talk about fish? Uh, <laughs> we, 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 we close at 9, but they're a little liberal, so... It's 5 to 9. If you need you to go 10, minutes. 10 minutes or something, let, let us know. Okay. I won't talk for another hour. Um, first of all, about fish. <laughs> Peter Morin had, a, as I said, had a three-point program. Clarification of thought, like this. Hours and hours and hours of talking about what is socialism, what is anarchism, how to make the world where it's easier to be good, how to build a new society in the shell of the old. Hours and hours of one fool at a time. Um, the second part of his three-point program was Houses of Hospitality, where people would live in voluntary poverty with the poor they serve, not a shelter where you go home at night and have staff but oh, workers really? and guests That's living together. The third point is where the fish come in. Um, 
farming communes where people could learn how to be self-sufficient in the principle of subsidiarity or small is beautiful, all part of that whole distributivism um, concept. However, and I really agree with the attack the Catholic woman. Uh, thank you, I attack the church a lot too. Um, there are a whole lot of people, yes, sir. many of the people that Catholic worker communities live with, um, the guests, are absolutely incapable of contributing to society in an economic way. They're addicted, they're old, they're ill, they're too young, they cannot work. We say, the Catholic workers, take the people that fall through the cracks, the people that really cannot, that, that we need to take care of because they cannot care for themselves. Now that's not totally true. We have lots of people who come as guests who become workers and help run houses. But you can't teach everybody in the world to fish. And I have a t-shirt that says that business about her career. Um, um, I want to thank James and um, Carl and Brad for their um, connections. Um, I think they were spot on. Um, and I kind of wish I hadn't, I winged this paper. I didn't you know, have a, a, a written talk. I was giving a formal talk tomorrow night and Dorothy. Uh, so I thought, well, I've just been thinking about it so much I can do it because I didn't really properly define the Catholic worker, and I apologize um, <coughs> for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Dorothy's abortion, because this is a huge sticking point for some people. Um, Dorothy's abortion was, first of all, she it was not on her mind her whole life, as the bishop was trying to make it. Um, she was certainly sorry for it, but she knew she was forgiven. She knew she was forgiven. We have a forgiving God, a merciful God. And she was living as an, an uncautious life when she was single before her conversion. She knew she was forgiven for her sin. Um, the bishops sometimes try to make it like, you know, uh, we're such a welcoming, coming home church, we can welcome and sanctify a woman who committed a great sin. Dorothy wouldn't have anything to do with that. I do suspect that if the church canonizes that they will do what they always do, they will do it for political reasons, and it's one of the reasons why we sort of object to canonization. I also think Dorothy has a wildness, um, and it, if Brad, um, I think, kind of encapsulated that, she had a, a, a strength and a specialness and a complexity that will somehow escape the bonds that even a, a powerful Catholic Church can. So there are those of us in the Catholic worker who would like to see the church become a prophetic church rather than an accommodationist church. Um, we're excited about the new pope. I don't think he's going to be strong enough to do that. I, I Personally, I think that the curia and the whole Roman thing is way too big. Um, it truly is the cross upon which Christ was crucified, as Dorothy would quote. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, lots else I could talk about. Um, the Dorothy was against big government. She was also profoundly countercultural, and the anarchism, personal, the man who spoke of personal anarchism. I mean, she was against. She would be tremendously against our consumer society of today. One of Peter Moran's easy essays, and, and James talked about it, about the whole idea of voluntary poverty, rich will become, the, the world would be better off if, if people become more poor. Peter really would give the second clothes in his closet, probably the first coat in his closet to people. He would give away the clothes off his back. He was so absolutely convinced of this sharing. Um, and. Uh, Few people are quite as pure as Peter was. Dorothy was always giving stuff away that people gave to her, and it would kind of drive folks crazy. You know, people would give her nice clothes because she never bought any clothes, and then they'd see it walking around on somebody else. But she um, was talking to a young worker one day, and the girl said, 
you know, Dorothy, I'm a written mistake. I'm really good at giving up everything, but I can't get rid of my books. Uh, and Dorothy looked at her and she said, oh, my dear, books are necessities. Okay. What is <laughs> Dorothy <laughs> loved the world. She, and that's why I think she was such a, a great Christian, because she thought God lived in the world. He can live up there in some pie in the sky. And we needed to make the world the world better. Um, who is it? Carl oh, mentioned vortex refusal. Vortex refusal is a very important part of many Catholic workers, as is communal sharing. Um, I love the quotation, if, if the Catholic worker depended on Catholics, it would have disappeared long ago. <laughs> that is certainly, certainly true today. Um, and it bothers some people, but I think it's very healthy because I think it speaks to the, the welcoming and the ecumenism that um, Dorothy spoke to. We say this, what would work Dorothy wish. do, WWDD. Um, many people no longer worry about what Dorothy would do. They worry about what they should do to address the problems of today, because the problems we have now are completely different than, than they were um, in the 30s, although I think the causes are essentially the same. And when Dorsey was told by Cardinal Spellman or one of his henchmen um, asked to take the name off or threatened to close the worker, she got out of it because she had a lot of middle class charm. And she, instead of deliberately saying, I will not, she just went home and kept quiet and it was fine because nobody wanted to really um, threaten her when she became this um, icon for the poor. Her pacifism um, was based strictly and purely on the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. That meant you don't kill enemies, you don't kill other people. And she would not agree, ever agree with the just war because just war, according to traditional just war theory, the way it was taught for years in the church, you cannot kill combatants. You can't have a war today without killing non-combatants. So um, just war is off the table as far as a Christian thing, although a lot of people are still um, thinking that it is. I've loved being here. Um, I think this is an exciting thing. Um, I could not contribute very much to the economic discussion, so I'm awfully glad that Carl and others were able um, to do it. I did have a lot of written that I researched on distributivism, but I forgot to bring it, so I yeah. absolutely couldn't do it with all those. Right. Yeah. But I thank you all, and if you'd like to buy books, I do have some books available to sell. The Dorothy Day book is $18, the other ones just go up. And you can get them all online and used now, except for the new ones. Yeah. Thank you.